Today, I will be going into interplanetary space in order to satisfy the contract, map asteroids with a Sentinel infrared telescope. This contract requires me to place my probe into a very specific orbit about the Sun. Not only will I look at how to do this, but also how to determine what fuel budget is required. Of course, I will also be looking in detail at the Sentinel telescope itself and how to use it. And finally, as this mission will take a large amount of game time to perform, we're going to really see the advantages of having those crude science labs in both the Moon's and Mimesis SOIs. Let's get started. Looking at the contract here, map 13 asteroids endangering Kerbin with a Sentinel infrared telescope. So getting into the details here, you do have to insert into a specific orbit. Uh, this is an orbit about the sun, it tells you that down there, with an apoapsis of 10 million or so kilometers and a periapsis about the same. It's very close to being circular with an inclination of zero. And I know it's hard to wrap your head around numbers when they get that big, but that is a little bit bigger than EVE's orbit. So part of this video is going to be about how do you build something to not go to a different planet, but just to insert yourself into a very specific orbit about the sun. And we'll get into the budgeting of that and a few different techniques, but that's going to be a little bit later in the video. In the meantime, let's go through the rest of these specifics here. We obviously have to have the Sentinel infrared telescope aboard. The orbit has to be about the sun and we got to map 13 asteroids. You know what, now that I think about it, I think I said all those things. So one thing I do want to make clear is that completing this contract is not necessary to get the asteroid recovery contracts. They are independent of each other. To get the asteroid recovery contracts, you need to have two things as far as I can determine. Number one is you need to have a tier three tracking station, which I do. But the other thing you need is you need to have unlocked the advanced grabbing unit and the advanced grabbing unit junior. These are the things that you typically would use to grab onto the asteroid. So I don't think you're gonna get those contracts until you have this node unlocked and the node in question is actuators. So because I do have a lot of science, I think I'm just gonna grab that one. I'm not gonna do an asteroid recovery mission today, but I would like to start to see those contracts starting to pop up. So perhaps we can do one in the future. But for now, let's get into our build. And we'll start off with the Octo-2 probe core because the Octo-2 probe core has no reactions wheels in it. I'm gonna right away slap a small set of reaction wheels down there on the bottom. Go into structure, we're gonna grab the smaller FL-A5 adapter, flip that, put that on the top because the infrared telescope, which you'll find under science is not that small, <laughs> it's pretty big. Now it's actually not that heavy, it's 100 kilograms, but it is kind of, kind of large like that. And there are no other nodes other than the node that's connected to it on the bottom. So it is a little bit awkward sometimes to build a probe around it. Now one thing about the infrared telescope, although it doesn't say it in here, it does require electricity to run. It's very similar to the scanners in the way they work. Uh, once it's up and running and detecting asteroids, it doesn't cost anything, but for that initial scan, it costs electricity, about 300 units of electric charge. As well, it does generate science, so we're going to end up wanting to transmit that science home. And so I would like to put on some batteries to cover all of that. And what I ended up doing, going into electricity, it's just grabbing a Z200 rechargeable battery bank, putting that under there like that. And then four of these Z400 batteries, just like so. And in the meantime, it's not gonna require a whole lot of electrical generation. What I just went with is the old AUX-4L 1x6 photovoltaic panels, which we will tuck in right here for now. These are these guys that don't retract once again, because once we have this thing in space, there's gonna be no reason to retract it. So that will cover the electricity needs fine. Also, we gotta think about communication. Now, the antenna that I really wanna use, remember, we're gonna be as far away as EVE, and if you recall with the EVE mission that I did do, the antennas I used were the Communitron HG-55. They serviced us very well. I would like to put on two of them, but like, I don't want to just stick them onto the side here. I think that looks kind of funny. So what I'm going to do is grab some octagonal struts. We're going to tuck these right in here. Let's get the 
translate tool slide that down a little bit just like so and then we're gonna put on two more I'm in two-way symmetry so I have it going on both sides and then we're gonna put the antenna let's retract these guys because they're gonna be in the way right on there like so let's spend a little bit of time doing a little bit of translating get them centered on those octagonal struts nicely so there we go so when these are extended they're kind of out of the way like that and these guys can extend below them like that so there's our basic probe of course what we need to do is get it to our destination that means starting to talk a bit about a budget so I actually did the math for this. If you want to learn yourself how to do the math for this, I do have videos on how to work all this kind of stuff out. The actual ejection from Kerbin is going to be about a thousand meters per second. And then it's going to be about 700 meters per second to get the capture into that final orbit at about 10 billion meters. Now the question becomes, how could you budget this if you weren't going to do the math? Well couple of things number one is if you take a look at the Delta V map and add up what the ejection cost is to Eve it is 1020 meters per second if you add those two numbers up and we being a little bit less than that shouldn't be surprising because our orbit is a little bit further out in other words a little bit closer to Kerbin than Eve's orbit is so the thousand meters per second that I worked out does make sense is there an easier way to get the 700 meters per second? Not really. The Delta V map is no help whatsoever. The capture costs around EVE all take into account EVE's gravity, which we're not going to have. We're just going to be doing a burn in interplanetary space. And the only non-math way I can think of of doing that is, well, going to something that you already happen to have in low orbit. So this is a very sad little space station that I put up here a long long time ago and have never expanded on it but what it is is something I can make maneuver nodes with of course this doesn't have to be a station any controllable object in low orbit about Kerbin will do you can also just put something up here temporarily using the game's console menu either way I'll just set up a Kerbin ejection to our target I'll talk about exactly how to set this up in detail when we get to the actual mission, but you can see I got a 968 meter per second burn, which jibes nicely with the 1000 meters per second I have in my budget. And then at periapsis now, I can just put a second maneuver and just see what's it going to cost me to get this capture. As long as you have something in low orbit about curve and you can plan these kind of things out and if I take a look at the second maneuver this is still showing the first maneuver so I got to go to maneuver two go to the details and I can see here it's costing 681 point something meters per second again remember my budget was 700 I like to round these things up so all of that's making sense but if doing the math is not something that you want to do this is really your only alternative as far as I can see Either way, now armed with our budget, we can continue with our build. It is pretty easy to build this to cover the entire 1700 meter per second budget, and you can do that if you want. But I want to split this up so that the final probe is quite small and just responsible for the final insertion. But then we'll add a transfer stage for the ejection from Kerbin, and that won't be staged until we're in interplanetary space, keeping Kerbin's local SOI free of debris. Recall that the budget for the final insertion burn is just 700 meters per second. And all I put on to accomplish that is a single Oscar B fuel can and then two LV-1R Spider radial engines. And then of course, a couple of blinky nav lights. And actually light this up just a little bit. I grabbed for one of the lights, these Dome Mark I lights, and I'm gonna put two of them I got the symmetry on and I'm going to flip it on its side like that. Notice that there's one here on the other side. And then I'm going to use the move tool. I know some people don't like part clipping, but I always figure these girders are kind of, they have space in the middle. So we're going to put that light in there like so. Is it looking like it's on the back? Yeah, it looks like it's on the back of the tele. And that's going to just kind of light up this region from the outside here a little bit. And that all resulted in a probe with a delta V of 922 meters per second, well over our budget, and a thrust to weight ratio of 0.56, which for interplanetary space is going to be absolutely fine. Okay, time for the next stage. 
Now remember what I'm shooting for here is 1700 meters per second, but this stage I like to also take care of the upper part of our orbital insertion into low orbit about Kerbin, so I'm going to add on an arbitrary about 1000. So I'm looking for something in around 2700 meters per second, and I accomplished that was simply a TD-06 decoupler, followed by a fairing. I do need to enclose all of this, so I grabbed a 1.25 meter fairing base. Won't build the fairing just yet. This is kind of tight, so I turned on the interstage nodes and moved it down to the first node like so, so there's a little bit of clearance here. And then for fuel, it is simply the FL-T200 fuel tank. Another one of those flat adapters, and then the spark engine on there on the bottom. That got me a total Delta V so far of 2,949, comfortably over my budget, with a 0 0.97 thrust to weight ratio on this bottom stage, which will be fine. Anything around 0.9 to 1 will be fine for the upper part of the atmosphere. Okay, let's fix up our staging, and then we'll put the deployment of the fairing into an action group rather than have it in the staging stack. And we'll build the fairing. And now all we need is a booster to go underneath this. That was another TD-06 decoupler. And then I grabbed another fairing base, the 1.25 meter fairing base, just to sort of create kind of a cowling here. This fairing, I have no plans to deploy, so we're gonna take it out of the staging. I'll even take the fairing expansion off, so that's just to make that transition there a little cleaner. And then of course we still have to think about budget, so I take the 1700 I got so far, add on 3800 meters per second, which I've been budgeting for a long, long time as a very comfortable getting into low carbon orbit budget to get me a total budget of 5,500, and I accomplished that with an FL-T100 fuel tank, followed by two of the FLT-800s. So I'm gonna flip that one upside down so the two dark parts are together. In between there, just for some extra stability, I'm gonna put a large set or advanced set of reaction wheels, especially with the fact there's gonna be a lot of drag associated with this big fairing on the top. For the engine on the bottom, I'm going with the LV-T30 Reliant. And again, because there's going to be a lot of drag associated with this big fairing at the top, I went with the bigger set of tail fins, the AV-T1 winglets. I'm gonna put on four of those. And with that, I ended up with a total delta V of 5,542 meters per second, just over our budget. And after tweaking down the thrust limiter a bit on the Reliant for a comfortable launch thrust to weight ratio, this thing was ready to go. But before I launch, I have one last thing I want to show you. Recall that I have science labs, crewed by scientists, cranking through the data that has been collected. One in orbit about the moon and the other on the surface of Minmus. This mission is going to take a lot of game time. Not only just to get out to the required orbit, but also to scan for the necessary 13 asteroids. Remember that the labs hold a maximum of 500 science, and once full, our scientists stop working. So I've set up alarms. The labs tell you the rate at which you are producing science, so it's easy to work out approximately when they are going to be full. You can see the next alarm up here, but if I go to the alarm menu, I can see them both. I should visit the Minmus base to transmit that science in 44 days, and the moon station in 54 days. But with that all set up, I can start the mission. The plan here is just to put this into an 85 kilometer equatorial parking orbit before making the ejection burn into interplanetary space. This is a little higher than my standard parking orbit of 80 kilometers, a habit that I have whenever I go interplanetary because sometimes long burns will cause your altitude to dip a bit and I don't want to worry about hitting the atmosphere. That said, our predicted ejection of 1000 meters per second isn't much more than what it takes to get to Minmus, so the extra caution really isn't necessary. I'm also going to take this opportunity to welcome aboard my most recent Patreon patron, Scop. Thank you very much, Scott, for your support. Of course, this appreciation extends to all of my most wonderful Patreon patrons and YouTube members who not only provide valuable support, but also have input into the direction this channel takes. 
But with our parking orbit achieved, it is time to perform our ejection burn into interplanetary space. Okay, I need to reduce my orbit. Right now I'm in an object in the same orbit as Kerbin. I need to bring this orbit down towards my target orbit. In fact, why don't we just do that so we can see our target orbit right there. How do I do that? I do that by ejecting myself from Kerbin in a retrograde direction relative to Kerbin's orbit about the sun. So Kerbin is going in this direction. We need to eject ourselves in this direction. So if I put myself back onto our vehicle here, go back downwards. It's always easy to tell because the day side of Kerbin, of course, is facing the sun. So the Terminator marks the direction of Kerbin's orbit about the sun. That way is retrograde. This way is prograde. So we need to eject ourselves out in that direction this way. Now, in fact, what I think I will do is just pop this ahead in orbit because this is only, it was only a couple of minutes ahead of where we are. We know this is going to be about a thousand meters per second. So let's just put in a thousand meters per second. Oh, um, well, there you go. That is a good sign. I like when that happens. And then we'll scroll out here and then you can see our ejection. All you got to do and this is the same if I was going to Moho or going to Eve. It's the same thing. You don't have to worry about ejection angles or anything like that. Or for that matter, if I was going to Duna or Jewel or Drez, it's the same deal. Just I'd be going the other way. All you need to do is adjust this timing. Here, let's give ourselves a bigger time jump so that you are ejecting yourself right along that Kerbin line just like just like that in fact if you take a look at our apple apsis to the sun when that's right at Kerbin, that's actually right at the right spot so that's pretty darn close right there and that will should have our periapsis again let's focus on the sun in and around where we are now if you really want to tune this in even more select the maneuver node right click on your periapsis and just go back and forth until that periapsis is as low as it will go all I'm doing is going back and forth in time a second each way that's it right 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 there and now you know you're at the perfect ejection angle there's no reason to worry about ejection angles or work them out you get your periapsis as low as it can go you're at the right place and again that's exactly the same whether you're going into just a general orbit about the sun or whether you're going to Eve going to Moho or whatever now I can see I'm over burning by just a little bit so I need to back off Get that periapsis just a touch. Just touch our orbit. And there we go. That is about all we got to do. So this burn's coming up in 30 minutes. So let's do it. All right. So that's that. Uh, next step in all of that is waiting the 176 days until we are down there. And by the way, uh, you might be with the telescope. You can try, but you'll find out you can't do any science here. It gives you a message here. Infrared telescope can't be done right now. The infrared telescope only works when you're in orbit of the sun. So, uh, well, let's let's get in orbit about the sun. And now that we are in orbit of the sun, I should be able to do a log observational survey. 30 science. Unfortunately, i got to bring it back for that. So only 16.8 science. So we're going to be transmitting it while we're still close to Kerbin. We might as well. And that's about it. Now, I could do the start. I'm going to wait to do the start object tracking until I'm actually in the required orbit. I don't want to end up borking out the contract at all. But what we can do is set up that final insertion burn. Down here, we will get our periapsis. Now notice that the only requirements are that the apoapsis and periapsis be these numbers. There's no argument to the periapsis. There's no longitude of the descending node or anything like that. So you don't have to get them in these locations. Just get them close to these values. To be honest, if I just circularize this, I'm sure this will be close enough. And with this now set up, it was time to get down there. But of course, along the way, I had some alarms to attend to. There's the one for Mimis. Okay, jump to vessel. And once there, I just right clicked on the science lab and pressed transmit science. 
And while that was transmitting, I took a look at the stored science that is yet to be processed and looked at how much data they represented and processed the ones that would fit into the lab. I also divided 500 by the processing rate of 9.7525 science per day to get that I'll need to be here again in a little over 51 days. If you toggle on the link to vessel, you get that prompt to jump straight to the vessel when the alarm goes off. Then, after a little more time warping, it was the moon station's turn to do the same. All told, in the time it took me to get to Periapsis, I visited my Mimbus base and moon station three times each, transmitting a buttload of science. Then came time to perform the burn. That stage will now be orbiting the sun forever. Maybe it's just me, but I enjoy scattering debris about, just as long as it isn't orbiting Kerbin where I have to look at it all the time. And all I'm doing is continuing this burn until our contract parameters go green. Oh, I think it just went green. I know our burn's not done yet. We still got 125 meters per second, but uh, yeah, we've reached our designated orbit. The uh, game considers us close enough. So here is our orbit. Okay, so now we grab this and we can say start object tracking. And it is on its way looking for asteroids and comets passing near Kerbin's orbit. And if we look at the note that comes with the contract, the mapping process will happen passively over a length of time as long as any active sentinels are near a specific orbit do not need to be newly launched. You will receive progress notification as suitable asteroids are mapped. So the telescope is always looking outwards from the sun at the next orbit. So this one is looking for asteroids and comets that are in and around Kerbin's orbit. If, for instance, you wanted to look at ones that were in and around Duna's orbit, then you would need to put one of these in orbit between Kerbin and Duna. And like it said, this occurs passively in the background. You don't have to be with this vehicle. That said, I want to do some time warping and see this thing work. Oh, 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 yeah. See, we just got... Sentinels now map 1 of 13. That took just a couple of days. 2 of 13. But, of course, before long, it was time to get back to Mimis to transmit some more science. From this point on, there is no reason to go back to the probe, so I just continued my time warping from here. 5 of 13, 6 of 13, until it was time to head to my moon station to do the same thing. All told, during this mission, these two labs transmitted over 3,500 science. And I didn't even make use of the landers that I have available that are capable of getting to any biome on their respective worlds to collect even more science. That said, we are closing in on our 13 asteroids, so why don't I take this opportunity to go over the main takeaways from this episode. Of course, I spent some time looking at the Sentinel Infrared Telescope itself. Watch out for those sneaky electrical costs that aren't mentioned in the part description. Also realize that the telescope scans outwards from the sun, looking at the orbit of the next planet out. I also spent some time going over how to make a Delta V budget for a mission when the DV maps are of limited use. I also looked at how to perform an insertion into a specific orbit of the sun. In particular, how to plan an efficient ejection from low Kerbin orbit, a technique that is not only helpful here, but for all interplanetary transfers. And finally, I demonstrated the power of science labs that generate science in the background while you perform other missions, especially when those other missions take a long time. Meanwhile, back with our contract, 11, 12, 13, and kill the Chi Morp. Our contract has now gone green. And with this contract complete, I'm going to be drawing this episode to a close. I hope you found it useful, and that I'll be seeing you again for the next one.